the Oregon Humanities Center, the sponsor for tonight's event. This is the launching of, the of our programming for the year on the theme of conflict. And we understood conflict from the beginning as both a noun and as a verb to conflict. And as we started planning our programming, it was very interesting that, needless to say, not surprisingly, the war, the wars, and veterans affairs once again rose to the forefront of our desire to present events that would engage with the community in a real and meaningful way. Some of you may remember that a couple of years ago we brought Dr. Edward Tick, who spoke about PTSD as a post-traumatic social disorder and worked very effectively in this very room, I think, on the topic of the um, challenges that that spring back with them. So in a sense, I like to think about this and our event with Stacey Bannerman tonight as a continuation of the beginning of the discussion that we started with Dr. Tick. And I'd like to alert you to at least one other of our events this fall that follows very directly on this same topic. On November the 4th here on campus, and then November 5th and 6th at the Bijou Cinema, we're hosting the world premiere of a documentary called In the Telling. It is a documentary about a theater production that puts vets on stage and allows them to re-engage with their communities um, when they return from active service. So it's a movie about a theater production in which vets take an active voice. And the Humanities Center is a major producer of that film, and we're really honored that we're going to be doing a world premiere here on the campus on the night of Friday, November the 4th, and then free showings on Saturday the 5th at the Bijou in the evening and Sunday the 6th in the afternoon. We have a really beautiful poster for that event on our display just outside the doors if you'd like to have a look at that. And I hope you'll join us for one of those three screenings. The first one here on campus on the Friday night will have a talk back with a director and I hope as well with some of the participants who were in either the theater production or in the production of the film. That's only one of the many things we're sponsoring this year, however, so please do keep up with our website and our uh, newsletter. We're always happy to put you on the, the list for the electronic newsletter or the hard copy if you prefer. It's going to be a year of um, difficult but very important conversations, I think. So I'm very glad to see you all here. This evening, I'm honored to introduce Stacy Bannerman, who is our 2011-12 CEDEC lecturer in the humanities. The endowment for the yearly Tzedek lectureship was established in 1996, which makes this the 15th anniversary, I guess, with a generous gift from steadfast donors to the center. The title is a reference to the Hebrew word for righteousness or justice, and the lectureship is intended to bring someone who is both a thinker and a practitioner, a researcher and a doer, someone who makes personal ethical responsibility to others the focus of his or her work. Once you've heard a little background on our speaker tonight, you'll see why she fits the bill for someone who makes the well-being of others the focus of her work. Ms. Bannerman is known, among other things, for her book from 2006 titled When the War Came Home, The Inside Story of Reservists and the Families They Leave Behind, an intensely personal and powerful recounting of reservists called up for active duty and the challenges they and their families face. Bannerman engages the topic of returning veterans in many ways other than that book, however. She's the founding executive directory, director of Sanctuary One. She is the executive director, or was the executive director, of the Martin Luther King Jr. Outreach Center, and the programming and marketing director at Genesis Two for Women, an alternative to sentencing agency. She was a charter board member of Military Families Speak Out, the first and largest organization of military families to, and I quote from her website, protest a war that their loved ones are fighting, unquote. She acts locally and nationally, having spoken to legislators in several states as well as testifying repeatedly before Congress as an advocate for better support and services for military families in all phases of combat deployment, including upon their return. <clears throat> Ms. Bannerman's efforts have met with success. She was influential in the introduction of the Federal Military Family Leave Act of 2009 and in the passage of Oregon House Bill 2744, 
which requires employers that employ 25 or more people in Oregon to provide leave to certain employees who are spouses of members of military forces on active duty during periods of military conflict. Not incidentally, Bannerman herself has received the Patriotic Employer Award. She is no stranger to media interviews, having done somewhere near 500 of them. Incidentally, she did number 501 with me this afternoon for our TV show UO Today, which will soon be available online on the UO channel. So you can either watch it when it broadcasts in a few weeks, or you can get it online from our site or the University of Oregon site. Just look up UO channel and search for Bannerman. She has held adjunct faculty positions at a number of colleges and universities. She's the author of many, many articles and is working on a new book. And the new book is, in fact, about a theater project named Homefront 911 that gives voice to the families of returning vets, a production which was well received recently in Portland. She travels a lot in pursuit of her cause, for which, as I discovered today, she's an exceptionally eloquent and compelling spokesperson. I think we're in for an important, dramatic, and rousing talk tonight. After the lecture, Ms. Bannerman is prepared to take questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, please come down to one of the two mics in the aisles, or if you have mobility issues or, or would prefer not to step down, we can bring you a cordless mic. The reason we're asking you to use a mic at all is because we are recording the event, and we'd like to make sure that we capture your questions as well as the answers. If you like this event and want to attend more like it, as I mentioned, I invite you to add your name to the mailing list of the Oregon Humanities Center, either in digital or in paper form. We will have a, the, a place for you to sign up in the, between the two doors out in the lobby on the way out, if you like. Our calendar of events on the website we keep, is kept complete and accurate, and you'll find details there. We also gratefully accept gifts at any time to support public outreach events like this one or our fellowship programs for UO graduate students and faculty. Finally, before handing over to our guest, I would be remiss if I didn't deliver a few more thank yous, especially now at the very beginning of the year's programming. My job as director of the Oregon Humanities Center is to put a public face on it and on our events. But before the events take place, there's a great deal of hard work that gets done by other people. Many thanks, therefore, to the staff of the center, to Peg Gearhart for publicity and communications, to Melissa Gustafson for all the practical arrangements, to Carol Bora and Lindsay Rogers, who are here tonight helping us with uh, crowd access, and to Julia Hayden, our associate director, who fielded an inquiry from Stacy and made the case that we should bring her here. Now, without any further delay, please help me welcome Stacy Bannerman. Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, a seven-year-old attempted suicide while his father was serving yet another tour in Iraq. His mother was one of more than a dozen military spouses that I have spoken with who have a child that attempted suicide during their father's deployment. When I was seven, it was 1972, and there were 69,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam. Men were still being drafted and deployed, but not my dad. So I was spared the circumstances that led a seven-year-old to try to kill himself. I have not, however, been spared the circumstances that have led an increasing number of army wives to try to end their lives. In January of this year, speaking at a military suicide prevention conference, next to her husband, Admiral Mike Mullen, recently retired, Deborah Mullen said that army leaders told her 
they lack the ability to track suicide attempts of military family members of army personnel because there are too many. America's war on terror, hallmarked by lengthy multiple deployments and a staggeringly high percentage of psychological problems among warriors, has deeply affected millions of military family members who are bearing the brunt of the war at home. For the first time in history, there are more military family dependents than men and women in uniform. Three plus decades ago, the typical GI was a single 19-year-old male that served one tour in Vietnam. Parents, and for many years, married men were exempt from the draft because of overwhelming concern about the harmful effects of deployment on the family. Today, 50% of the troops who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan are parents. A majority of them are married, and nearly half have served multiple lengthy tours. Now, we know that repeat deployments stress soldiers and escalate the likelihood of psychological injuries that can last for a lifetime. There is a rapidly growing body of evidence suggesting that the same is true of the families left behind. Since the 2003 invasion of Iraq, outpatient mental health care use by military kids has more than doubled. Inpatient, and people only go for inpatient treatment if their doctor has reason to believe that they are at risk of causing harm to themselves or others, or they've had a psychotic break. Inpatient mental health treatment of military children has increased 50% since 2003, and boys with a deployed parent report nearly twice the rate of suicidal ideation as civilian boys. Investigations into the effects of deployment on military family members began in earnest several years after the wars were launched. By then, it had become increasingly clear that the mission in Iraq had not been accomplished and there was no end in sight in Afghanistan. And what has begun to emerge is compelling evidence showing that America's military families are in crisis, presenting severe debilitating symptoms of deployment-related stress, clinical depression, and chronic anxiety, virtual mirrors of the troops who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan. But these family members did not sign up. Their loved ones did. But they are bearing the burden of war just the same and seem to be sustaining psychological injuries at nearly the same rates as the troops. Spouses and service members report comparable levels of major depression and generalized anxiety disorder. Research published in 2010 in the New England Journal of Medicine revealed a clear link between incidents of army wives attempting suicide and the deployment tempo of their husbands. Further evidence suggesting a direct causal relationship between deployment and military family mental health is that when the US surged in Iraq, sending more than 20,000 troops to stabilize the country, Mental health hospitalizations of military kids surged too. Now, if we were a nation at war, rather than a military at war, this 
would be an American problem. We are not. So it's a Pentagon problem. But there's no Department of Military Family Affairs. There are no powerful lobbyists or highly paid advocates for the people left behind. We lack the social cachet and political currency of combat veterans. And there is just no way to spin a suicidal second grader into a poster child for patriotism. And since there's not a Walter Reed to tend the invisible war wounds of army kids, there's no potential lightning rod to shock the people or embarrass the administration in the America I grew up in. We wouldn't need one. Because that America did not send soldier parents to war over and over and over again. That America wanted to protect its children from the debilitating effects of deployment. That America believed and acted in concert with the belief that the burden of war should be borne by the nation. That the family unit should not and could not withstand the burden of having a father in harm's way for a year, much less year after year after year. That America would have wept at the thought of a suicidal seven-year-old and brought the father home immediately. When America got the war it wanted in 2001, and again in 2003, I presumed the nation would go along. After the September 11th attacks, the country was about as united as 50 states can ever get. Galvanized by the first strike on American soil since Pearl Harbor, people came together. We rallied around then President Bush as he vowed to take the fight to the enemy. And just over 10 years ago, US Special Forces went into Afghanistan and Operation Enduring Freedom started with the support of roughly 90% of Americans. Slightly more than one year later, Congress passed a resolution giving President Bush the authority to use military force in Iraq, citing weapons of mass destruction and the known presence of Al-Qaeda members responsible for the September 11 attacks, neither of which we now know was true. While there was no formal declaration of war, Operation Iraqi Freedom commenced on March 19, 2003 with the shock and awe campaign. And the overwhelming use of force was matched by overwhelming support at home with 76% of Americans in favor of sending the armed forces to fight on a second front. But the efforts on the war front were not matched with any effort whatsoever to secure a home front. And for the first time in modern history, the US declared war without mobilizing the nation by way of a war tax, a draft, war bonds, rationing and other means, including government subsidized ads and radio programs, scrap drives to collect paper and rubber for recycling, and the War Advertising Council's Women in War Jobs Campaign, which had introduced America to the fictional character Rosie the Riveter. See, in previous wars, those state-sanctioned Programs and policies and calls for action spread the sacrifice amongst civilians. They compelled America to keep the implied promise that the burden of war would be borne by all of the country's citizens. But all that was asked of the American people for the war on terror was 
continued participation and confidence in the American economy. And then President Bush advised Americans to go down to Disney World in Florida. Take your families, the president said, and enjoy life the way we want it to be enjoyed. The Bush administration appeared determined to rely on American materialism to cover the costs of war and proceeded to fully excuse the country from the obligations of wartime fiscal citizenship. And rather than implement a surtax tied to the war, Congress instead approved a $1.35 trillion tax cut in 2001 with especially generous reductions for the wealthy. And then in 2002, as the war in Afghanistan was entering its second year, and Vice President Dick Cheney was banging the drum for war in Iraq, the Bush administration's budget director justified the tax cuts by saying, Americans are being taxed at the highest peacetime rates in history. While waging war in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Bush administration raised the debt ceiling seven times. And this, this abandonment of wartime fiscal responsibility was painted as patriotic by our political leaders. Nothing is more important in the face of war than cutting taxes, said then House Majority Leader Tom DeLay. And he helped Congress pass additional tax cuts to the tune of $350 billion. Now, these cuts came around the time that Operation Iraqi Freedom was initiated. At that point, there were more than 135,000 troops on two fronts, and defense spending was skyrocketing. And then, in 2005, as the war on terror was entering its fifth year with nearly 200,000 American forces in combat, Americans were offered a one-time telephone tax refund. In previous wars, that telephone tax had been raised to pay for the cost of war. But with this war, over 70% of eligible Americans who filed a 2006 federal income tax return got a phone tax refund while an additional 20,000 troops were surging into Iraq. The American people and politicians bought the war, but they refused to pay for it. What they were willing to pay for between 2003 and 2006 was five million new homes and 110 million shiny new cell phones. In that time, Americans bought 60 million big new cars and trucks and complained about the price of gas while our loved ones were paying for oil in Iraq with an arm and a leg and a life. And there would be no talk of new taxes for the duration of the Bush administration and over the course of the wars, Congress repeatedly approved massive emergency appropriations to foot the bill and those expenditures were rarely questioned by the public. By 2010, some members of Congress thought it was time maybe to start paying for these wars. And the Share the Sacrifice Act proposed a 1% surtax on federal income tax liability to cover the cost of the war in Afghanistan, which has been greatly expanded under President Obama. But this was labeled an anti-war propaganda stunt by political leaders. And the bill never made it out of the House or into the national conversation, but really, the nation hadn't been talking about these wars for a very long time. We certainly hadn't been hearing much about them in the news. Obama had lifted the ban 
put in place by President George W. Bush that pro prohibited pictures of troops killed in action from appearing in the media. I don't know if you recall the photo of 20 flag-draped coffins of being loaded into an aircraft carrier. When that was published on the front, front page of the Seattle Times in 2004, and that ban of the war dead was still in place, the photographer, Tammy Cecilio, who was working for a contractor over there in Iraq, was fired swiftly along with her husband. It had happened during Vietnam. That picture of war dead provided a spark for the anti-war movement. But it wasn't until Gold Star Mother, Cindy Sheehan, sat down in a ditch in Crawford, Texas, outside the Bush Ranch the following summer and that the nation began to pay attention. Now, millions had participated in the global day of protest uh, before the invasion of Iraq, and there were large anti-war marches in the U.S. during the months prior. But in the years since, the anti-war movement had waned.